and let's get to it. This year we have a new project, and here to tell you more about it is Nick Ruprechter, who manages the START Fellowship Program. Nick, tell us a little bit about it. Thank you very much for the warm welcome, Jack. Um, so this new project is actually a philanthropic accelerator program. With this, we envision that young founders from emerging markets come to Switzerland for six months to build their visionary ideas into impactful startups. Um, the program ranges from having workshops with experts, courses at uni, to a whole exchange with our network that we built now over 25 years. We believe that this network, the power of start, really grows those companies so that they can push the local ecosystems uh, in Latin America, wherever it might be, the same way that we do it here in Switzerland. And, and what motivated START to, to form this program? So I think we now tried and did for 25 years a lot of empowerment for young founders. But we also discovered that there is a huge inequality of chances amongst young founders. If you are brilliant and have a great idea in an emerging market, you might not have the environment to really fulfill its potential. So we believe that those great minds should become part of an environment that really fosters their ideas and pushes them to maximize the impact. With that being said, um, I think we want to hand over to our panel that actually gives you a clearer understanding because we have Enrique Dubogra, a super young and smart founder from Brazil. He founded his first startup with 16, became a Stanford dropout Y Combinator uh, participant, and then actually off to found Brex, one of the fastest ever growing unicorns. We have him here in conversation with Danny Gutenberg, probably the unicorn hunter of Europe, uh, who is a great entrepreneur himself and famously invested in Facebook, Airbnb, uh, NetSpace, and more at an early stage. So we're very excited to welcome you here to talk about what it may means to found a startup in your 20s. Please, Enrique and Dani, the stage is yours. And I'll leave it to you. Okay, are we on? Hello. Hi, Enrique, how are you today? I'm good, Danny. good to see you, how are you? <laughs> I was just going to call in for a second uh, to find out uh, how my uh, investment is doing. Uh, mm -hmm. But before that, um, uh, do you remember how we met? Um, I do, but I think you should, uh, tell, you should tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to check if you remember that I actually was already invested in your first company uh, before, um, before you started Brex in, in Pagarami. <laughs> But uh, of course, a legendary story uh, happened when you came to visit me in Switzerland and uh, we went to uh, drive to a fondue restaurant in Switzerland. And on the way, I don't know if you remember that, but on the way we passed the house of um, Tina Turner and I asked you, and I, I was very proud and I was uh, saying here, that's where Tina Turner lives and you were <laughs> telling me who's that i don't know her that's when i realized that i'm getting really really old <laughs> well that, that probably says more about me than about you but yes <laughs> so um so tell me something um how did brex do since i invested what, what what's been happening with brex since you uh, started it and why did you start it yeah so um you know uh, Brex, what we're doing is we're trying to create the financial operating system for the next generation of businesses, right? So we started with our first product, which was our corporate card for startups. And that's kind of what we're mostly known for. Um, and we, we, we grew a lot to like, you know, in the U.S. now, there's a very big percentage of startups that use Brex uh, and, and growing. We think we can have a you know, a dominant market share in that, at least in this segment, you know, in the next one to two years. But we also expanded and launched uh, a lot of new products like Brex Cash, which is our bank account replacement product, and a lot of new software initiatives we're having. So I think um, 
Yeah, a lot has changed since you invested that we were uh, a one product, corporate car for one segment startups, and now we're serving um, many types of businesses with, uh, you know, a few different products as well. So that's like super exciting. <laughs> so tell us, uh, how did you get the idea to do um, uh, this marketing that you do? You do a very special uh, marketing, uh, offline marketing, right? Yeah, so we got... Um, we got pretty well known for a billboard campaign we did in San Francisco, which, uh, you know, it shouldn't be that innovative, but, you know, it kind of was a little bit that uh, we realized in San Francisco that most of our customers were there. So it was easier to target them through billboards than it was through Facebook and Google uh, because there's just such a concentration of startup founders in the Bay Area that it wasn't hard to go and, uh, um, and target them. And so we basically did a San Francisco billboard takeover in which we got most of the billboards in the city, you know, like a very, very big percentage of them. And we didn't pay that much money. So we have a very simple tagline of like, hey, Brex, a credit card for startups. Um, and what happened is, you know, it just helped Brex in so many different ways than we were really even expecting, you know, and I, I wish I could say I was the, kind of genius behind the idea, but the idea came from our head of sales, actually, that, uh, that you know, had uh, seen some good, good effects of billboards in the past. And we got, a, you know, he was able to get us a, a great deal uh, to buy a lot of them. So we're like, you know, we're not, why not? Um, and it helps with a lot of stuff, like, you know, not only the, the actual customers that came in, but like, like recognition for recruiting engineers. Um, it helped like for the longest time, once we were reaching out to, to customers, like as an outbound, they already had heard of us, help with press, help with investors, because they were seeing our name all the time. So I think like it just had a big amount of mind share for Brex in the Bay Area, which helped in like different ways. And I think we got pretty, pretty well known for it as well. Excellent. So let's... um. Go one step back and uh, go back to your first company, Pagarami, that you started when you were 16. Is that correct or 15? I'm not 16. sure. I think you, your 16, partner 16. was 15 at the time, right? Uh, I think I was just turning 17 and he was just turning 16. Okay. So tell me, how did you get the idea? How did you get started? How did you get Arpex to invest in it? Yeah. So, um, you know, my, the, the way I we, we kind of came to idea was Pedro and I, and Pedro's my co-founder was kind of different. So I had just uh, won a hackathon by building this dating app called Ask Me Out. That was basically like Tinder, but instead of geolocation as Facebook friends, so you could like and match your Facebook friends. And then I tried to implement a payment system was like Pagsagura at the time, which was like really, really bad. Um, so I, I had like this like negative experience of payments and then Pedro, my co-founder, he basically, uh, he, he, he got very hacker famous when he was very young because when he was 12, he like found the first uh, jailbreak for the iPhone 3G in the world. And that's usually a thing that like comes out of Russia or China or something, um, or, you know, even the US and it came out of Brazil from this like little kid. So he got like pretty hacker famous and uh, we met and what happened because of that is he got hired by one of Brazil's largest payments companies to basically go and you know, rebuild their iOS app because no one in Brazil understood iOS security and he was hiring iPhones. So he got kind of like into payments by working in this company. When he was 14, he went to work at this payments company, which is kind of random. Um, and then uh, we, we met in the end of 2012, basically like on Twitter fighting text editors. I was one called Vim, he was one called Emacs. Um, and, you know, it got too complicated to fight over 104 characters, we went to Skype and on Skype we became best friends. Uh, and decided to start a company together. And then since he was working with payments, I had just had this bad experience. We thought, hey, there's probably like an opportunity to build better payments. And we didn't really know what that meant at the time. And we kind of like iterated over that a little bit, but uh, but that's kind of how we, um, we, 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 we did it. Oh, and we decided to start. And then, you know, I think we were both super young, so we didn't have any money. So like raising money seemed like the, the right thing, the right thing to do. Um, and then uh, Pedro and I, we both independently met Andre from Arpex. Um, Pedro, I think, met him through a friend of his mom, you know, actually a year or two earlier before we started this company. And 
I, I met Andre through, through um, you know, through our, our, our mutual uh, friend, Giorgio Paolo, and then, you know, we both met him, and then we, I think it was super lucky because, you know, Andre also started a company when he was 15 in payments in Brazil. So, you know, what are the chances that there's like another entrepreneur that started a company as a teenager in the same country as you are, and that person turns out to become an investor? So I think in some way he related to uh, to us and, uh, and you know, decided to invest, which uh, was, was a great opportunity for us at the time. Excellent. So Jorge Paulo is uh, really uh, the big connector. So, so then you, you, you started your company in Brazil, you sold it, uh, you moved to the States, uh, went to Stanford, dropped out, started a new company. Um, so what are the differences from, you know, the ecosystem in Brazil and, and how you, you know, how you proceeded in this ecosystem and, and the second time when you did the same thing in, in the Silicon Valley, what, what are the big differences? There's actually a lot of them. It's pretty different. Um, and I'll tell you a few of the bigger differences. The first one is like, you know, on the, let's call, start with the positive side for Brazil, or, you know, I think other emerging markets are somewhat similar. Um, the first thing is like, there's not a lot of competition. So like, you know, we had a few payments competitors, but they were not really good. Um, so if we were just doing something better, it was kind of like, didn't take too much money and too much time to get ahead of the, of the competition. So especially for something like super local, like payments, it wasn't that there was like a bunch of like international companies doing super well in Brazil, you know, like um, at that time. So it was not super hard to win over the local competitors. And I think that was, that was very important because like, you know, we were super inexperienced and super young. So, you know, we built a product that looking back, it was, it was good, probably not as good as we could have built today, you know, with like more experience. Um, but, you know, comparing, contrasting it to Brex, like we could have definitely not started Brex and, you know, if we were 16, um, without any experience, like it was a company that required us actually to know a lot about payments and know a lot about fintech in order to, to start versus in Brazil, Pagarme, we could actually start it, you know, at 16 without knowing anything about payments. Um, because the market is just like a lot less competitive and, you know, their competitors are just like a lot less good. So, uh, I think that was like something that was unique and special about Brazil. The other thing that is easier in some way is like hiring experienced people is somewhat harder than the US, but like just hiring people in general is less competitive too. So, you know, like convincing people to come work at a startup is like, it's cool. Like a lot of people wanted to do it because, you know, it was novel. Um, in the US, like you have 200,000, you know, not 200,000, but like at least a thousand startups reaching out to the same engineer at any given point, um, all saying we're going to be the next Facebook and, you know, all paying super competitively and all doing all these things. And I think when we were in Brazil, you know, we were the, sometimes the only startup to reach out to, to an engineer and they were like super happy to come work at a startup, you know, and, um, and, you know, we didn't, at the time, it wasn't even common to give equity to everyone. So it's like, it was, it was somewhat even cheap, um, you know, and I think that that made hiring and retaining people actually like keeping, keep, keeping people at the company, like easier than it, than it is in the U S. Um, and a third point I will say on the positive side, and this will, is like, there is a lack of capital, which could be interpreted as positive or negative, but think that there's a lack of capital for everyone. It's not just for you. Um, so it makes the market a lot more rational in a lot of ways because, because like, you know, we had to be profitable with like, we raised $300,000 and it was the only money we raised and we had to be profitable with that money. And that was it, you know, and I think the market's developed more now and a lot of people are raising a lot more money in Brazil, but at the time it wasn't a lot of investment in Brazil. So it just forced us to be so efficient and so good, um, because we couldn't raise more money. And I think that made the company it was good for the company at that moment. And 
I think, you know, after that, like capital definitely would have made a, a big difference in order to make us grow faster. But for a little bit, I think it, it was, it was, uh, it was positive. So that's on the positive side, I would say pro Brazil. Um, pro us, there's a lot of pro us. So, uh, big difference in the u.s is like a lot of stuff is a lot more efficient so i remember like opening a company in brazil took like a month and a half um you know setting up an office getting internet you know like all this stuff was like painful and like i had to personally spend a ton of time like figuring this stuff out in the u.s in like two days you have everything set up you know and it was just except the bank account and the credit card that was super hard that's what bill brex but um otherwise everything was like much much easier so, you know, you just spend a lot more time thinking about in Brazil about like things that don't matter, you know, like labor law and how to not get sued and, you know, all these like decisions in the U.S. is kind of all an autopilot, which is really nice. Um, second thing, and this is probably the largest difference is around like executive hiring. So, you know, one of the coolest things about the U.S. is like, you know, we hired uh, our CFO, for example. He was like one of the first employees. And when we hired him, he already knew how to do a lot of stuff because he had gone, gone through like a pretty successful fintech startup in the U.S. And we were able to hire him. And then like different in Brazil, we had to like kind of look at what everyone was doing and kind of... Uh, make sure they were doing the right thing. And this guy just knew so much more than us we did in this certain area. And we just didn't have to think about it. We had, we can go like focus on product engineering and stuff we liked or whatever it was that we were focusing on because he was just managing everything and we didn't have to care. Like in Brazil, that was so rare that we could hire someone that we didn't have to think about what they were doing. They just like completely managed, completely self-sufficient, you know, and just like knew a lot more than we did about something. Like in, in Brazil, I always had the impression that you know, if Pedro and I sat down to do someone's job for six months, we'd probably like be better than them. And like, you know, for, for this guy, we probably thought that like, even if we spent our whole lives doing it, we probably wouldn't be better than him and what he was doing, you know? And I think that was like a massive difference because it allows you to scale so much more to spend your time on something else, but you don't have to like keep managing every function so closely. Um, and the reason that exists in, in, in the US and it didn't exist in Brazil at the time is because there's so many startups that grew and the job of managing a big company and the job of growing with a company is so much different that in Brazil, you can only hire people who like came from big companies. You know, you know, you can never hire a CFO that was super early employee somewhere and then saw that grow from 50 to a thousand employees. It's just very rare. And that will come as the ecosystems develop more, you know, there's more startups, more funding, more companies growing and that too is happening. So it's a, it's a natural maturing part of the ecosystem, but, you know, it just makes a lot of things much, much easier because you can just like skip other company mistakes. Or for example, our head of engineering came from Stripe and Stripe has a you know pretty uh, respected engineering culture. And we could just skip a lot of the mistakes that they had because we had this engineering guy that like just saw a lot of the mistakes and we could just like skip them. Um, so that was incredibly important and helpful to scale. And I would say the third thing on the positive side to the S, and this is probably obvious, is just the availability of capital, right? Like, you know, we we started Brex in March 2017. By October 2018, we had like over 150 million dollars in our bank account. Like, 150 million was like, you know, there's a lot of that size rounds today. But for us, it was like coming from Brazil. This is more money that we can like process in our brains, you know, and um, and it just allows you to uh, do things so much faster and like not have to worry about you know, like how much, like how much are we spending in like, you know, office pens every month in Brazil, we would like go through like everything we were spending and making sure like, you know, and honestly, that's kind of a good culture. We're probably waste a little bit too much money on Brex, but, and the, and the other sense, like it just allows us to focus on what's important, which is hiring the best people, building the best product and attacking the market really fast because we don't have to worry about, about capital. Right. And that's kind of a little bit of the formula that Silicon Valley teaches you. Um, so I, I could talk about this for the full time. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, that, that, <laughs> that's a good point. We are almost all out of time. Yeah. Um, so uh, I understand that correctly. You raised totally ever only 300,000 for Pargarmi. Yeah. And, 
and uh, you started, you raised already 150 million in the first year of existence of Brex while you were like something 20, 21, something like this. Yep. So now you're 25 and, uh, and the company uh, has grown tremendously since, uh, since 2017 when you founded it. Where do you see yourself? Um, I mean, looking at the difference from, from you know, 16 to 21, so the next step will be like when you're 20, uh, when you're 30, like five years from now. Where do you see yourself? Uh, honestly, just running Brex. Um, you know, I think that one thing that, you know, people always say is like, oh, Enrique, you're like a serial entrepreneur. I'm just like, no, I don't want to be a serial entrepreneur. I just want to be a mono entrepreneur. I just want to want like one thing for like a long, long period of time. Um, and, you know, and, and that's what it, kind of see my, myself doing for five years and honestly 10 years it just hopefully a larger scale than we are today and that's amazing that's really amazing are you um are you going to go public or are you going to you're not going to sell the company i understand from what you're saying now are you going nope. to raise more money or what's the what's the way forward are you going to acquire companies are you going to come to europe what, what's on your plate right now all, all of the above, honestly, um, you know, <laughs> with the right timeline. Uh, we definitely want to be a public company eventually. I think, uh, you know, it's especially important for financial services companies to, to eventually go public. Uh, we definitely want, um, we definitely want to expand internationally. We definitely want to raise more money. We definitely, you know, all, 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 all these things are, are on the horizon. And uh, we're, the only thing we're not doing is we're not selling the company. Okay. Well, I think we're um, at the time limit. Thank you so much for making uh, time for, uh, for us here and to, uh, uh, and to be such an example for all the students. Uh, and I hope there's many of them uh, watching today. I'll uh, have uh, Nick is coming back into the uh, call and will maybe tell us how many uh, people are watching right now. <laughs> Well, the number of people, I sadly can't tell you right now, um, but we are in the four digits, so that's super nice. Thank you for creating this. Um, Enrique, thank you very much for your time already. I have l one last question because you make it look so relaxed. Um, what would you recommend to really those young people, let's say they are 20, 21, aspiring a similar crazy, crazy growth just as you did? I think what I recommend is, um, you know, and I talk to a lot of students, so is don't, don't optimize for optionality. I think a lot of times I see students making decisions like, oh, I want to go do consulting or I want to do this or I do that. And not because they ultimately want to do that, it's because they want to create optionality for the future. And I think my, my learning from my life and my, my recommendation is if you want to go do something, you, you don't need to prepare for it. You can just go do it and doing it is the best preparation you can have. So don't focus on building your CV or any of these things. Just go do whatever you want to do and, uh, and I'm sure it will work out. That sounds really like a great hands-on advice. Um, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, I got to say, I'm really... <laughs> really fascinated for, uh, by you because, um, yeah, you've been a guest of Dani's Fondue and I had the same with 19 founders from Colombia and Romania. Mm -hmm. So there's some pressure on it, uh, but all the best in the future and thank you for making the time again. Thank you so much. Thank you. All Bye, right. Enrique. Yeah, next up, um, we will continue the conversation with Dani Gutenberg. Um, because we've heard now the great founding story from the eyes of uh, Enrique, but also we want to have the investor's perspective on it. Um, and Dani, um, I described it before already, you are definitely one that has a very, very great sense of finding unicorns. Um, so maybe you can tell us a bit, like, what are the traits that you look for in unicorn founders? Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, I'll be known as the fondue investor from <laughs> now on, I think. <laughs> so um, I'm looking for, you know, people that have a very uh, strong urgence to uh, change the world. People that have, you know, seen a problem 
and 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 do not accept this problem to be there in the future for other people and are working to to change that and uh, i'm also looking for people that um, are respected all throughout. They're respected from their um, co-workers, respected from their investors, respected from their friends. Uh, and, 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 and that's kind of how I, uh, when, when I see that everybody around uh, is, is, uh, is really looking up to, uh, that, that always gives me a very strong uh, sense of uh, I need to invest. Well, that sounds um, like really a great signal and also makes it a lot about the personality of the founder. Um, maybe can I kind of ask in that sense, we've heard about Enrique now that he was in Brazil, kind of made it there and then grew even bigger in the US. Um, you are an international investor at the same time. You have in, been investing in Israel, in the US, in Europe. Um, can you maybe tell us if you think that the ecosystem plays a role here in developing those traits in a founder. Oh yeah, definitely. I, uh, uh, I mean, you can, uh, you can see that the ecosystem is important, uh, especially in, in small ecosystems like the Silicon Valley in Israel, where everybody knows everybody and everybody shares, uh, you know, their uh, uh their ideas on on how to uh, start something uh like enrique said before it, it's much easier in the silicon valley if you need somebody to make a website or uh the payments or the security or uh, and the same thing is happening in israel as well there's an ecosystem where you can just you know pick up the phone ask another founder how did you solve that problem uh and you get an address and uh or an email and and uh and, and 10 minutes later you, you find somebody that you can offload this problem and 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 run with it and um, maybe much more difficult in in larger ecosystems and and not as uh, advanced ecosystems like brazil so i, I think that's a, a big difference that you can uh that you can just call up the guys and and, and move very quickly Great, yeah, that's definitely uh, a super important aspect. Um, and I mean, you still invested in Brazil, for example, right? Um, back then when Enrique was with Pagame. So um, this ecosystem has an influence for sure, but it didn't keep you away from investing, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, in, in, uh, in Brazil, when I invest there though, I, I won't just uh, look at every single business plan that comes to me. I will only accept business plans from people that I trust in Brazil and, and that will you know, tell me this is outstanding from all the other Brazilian startups I've seen. And, and pretty much the same in, in, uh, in Israel. Um, not the same in Europe and in the US where I really look at everything that I can read and, and, and put my hands on. And, and really study every uh, business plan and will actually also do cold calls and call up companies, startups to, to invest in. All right. Yeah, I mean, um, that sounds like a very straightforward approach to actually find the unicorns. Um, to once more touch back on the ecosystem, I mean, what I think Enrique also told about it, uh, taught about it already that um, there are there's talent available, capital, but what does play a role in terms of infrastructure for you as an investor? What has to be there around a startup to yeah, make you see the potential that it could become a unicorn? Uh, I don't think that's very important. I, I'm, I'm not so concerned about the infrastructure. I'm, I'm really, I mean, uh, it's, you know, one, two, three, four, five percent of the importance. Uh, I'm really 80 percent on the on the founder and the person uh, and the CEO. Um, and then, you know, the rest, the other 20 percent might be a little bit infrastructure, might be um, a little bit uh, market, a little bit even the product, of course, is also important, but not as important. And by far, for me, as a as a as a unicorn hunter, not as important as the person. If if I find somebody that has a, an idea and I feel that he will make his idea work, um, then I'll trust that he'll you know 
somehow go around the infrastructure problem, um, no matter how big the problem is. Great, great. Yeah, um, also that again is very straightforward and hands on. Um, do you ha maybe have one last advice also for the students from the Unicorn Hunter perspective? Um, if they're looking to found, what can they do to end up at your desk at one day? <laughs> well, I, I think to end up at my desk, uh, the, the, the easiest way is to convince people that I know already. Uh, so uh, check for um, uh, um, people that, that know me. And, and you've heard from Enrique, that's the, how he got into uh, to, uh, Andre Street, uh, who is, I think, also on, on one of your panels here on the Start Summit. Uh, it is because he had a personal connection through his mother and uh, his co-founder Pedro also had a personal connection and, and they both um, you know, approached Andre and, and that's how they get his attention. And, and I think that's the easiest way nowadays um, to approach an, an investor cold is uh, super difficult. I mean, then you really need to have either uh, extremely convincing numbers uh, from already starting your company uh, or a product that is um, a black swan that is completely something different. Um, but uh, if you if you can uh, find out who in your network can help you and can give you a good reference and 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 uh, and approach uh, don't don't approach cold, I would say. Awesome, awesome. Um, I mean, yes, to the audience, you should definitely go watch Andre Street talk with Florian Schweitzer on Saturday. Um, and also, as Dani said, the network, the connections really matter. And this is what we want to do with the Start Fellowship, connecting the young founders from emerging markets to the network we have here in Start. Um, in that sense, I also want to thank you, Dani, once more for inviting all of us over for dinner, um, 19 Romanian and Colombian founders. And to the audience, once more, if you want to watch what they created since they've met Dani, I suggest uh, to view all the fellowship events throughout the week, namely also the pitching competition on Thursday. And with that, I would say we reached the end of our time. Dani, thank you very much for all the support, uh, creating our, pushing our initiative so much and have a great night. It was really my pleasure and I'm looking forward to have you guys for the next Fondue soon. We will. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye.